Uh, da, 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 da. So please make sure if you have your microphone off, first of all, to turn your microphone, or if your microphone is on, turn your microphone off. Otherwise, we get a lot of feedback running through here. So make sure your microphone is off. I don't care if your video is on, that's cool. I can say hi, I can see you. Uh, all of that gets edited out when I post this onto YouTube because the only thing that's being recorded is my window that, that I can see in here, uh, none, of, none of your windows. Reminder here is we have a chat window. So if you can type your questions, since I'm not, uh, I don't wanna hear questions because there's a lot of extra noise. If you can type your questions, there's a chat window down at the bottom if you're on a computer you can open that up clint is responding to any of your text questions so he can see them as they're rolling through make sure as you're as you're chatting as you're typing don't repeat your question over and over and over again we will go back through those questions at the end and read through them and, and answer as many as we possibly can uh, clint is is writing them down he'll give them to me yeah he's got he's waving his pen in the air <laughs> he'll, he'll, he will let me know what's going on. Um, that way we can keep track of everything. Just a little bit of time and we'll just kind of sit here and chat a little bit. Since we're waiting, how long have you been a paleontologist? Oh, starting it off. All right, how long have I been a paleontologist, Clint asks. Um, forever. <laughs> I've been cleaning fossils for about 27 years, but I've been hired by the state of North Dakota for the last 12 years. It, uh, it keeps me busy. Um, for those of you who are new, who didn't tune in, tune in yesterday, uh, my name is Becky Barnes, and I am a paleontologist with the North Dakota Geological Survey. So these presentations that we're doing Monday through Friday, we're going to hope to do this Monday through Friday as long as school is out. We just were notified as of about five minutes ago that school is out for Bismarck next week as well. So you can tune in next week, Monday through Friday, and we will continue our chatting sessions at 10 o'clock central. We will be recording these sessions, or I am recording these sessions so that you can uh, log on to YouTube and watch them later, at which point I have time to work my magic and add stickers and text and all kinds of fun stuff as overlays to, <laughs> to the videos. Um, because, we, we, because we work for the North Dakota Geological Survey, we, uh, we're gonna be kind of North Dakota centric. So that's, that's the material that we're working with. That is what we're studying. Those are the papers that we're publishing. Those are the digs that we're running. Those are the localities that we're visiting. So it's gonna be very North Dakota heavy. Uh, if you are tuning in from out of state, welcome, welcome, learn about a different state. Uh, if you are tuning in from across North Dakota, uh, we thank you, thank you for joining us, and we would love to hear where you're tuning in from. So feel free in the chat window off to the side, if you want to, to type in, where are you from? Uh, what grade are you in? What are you interested in? Again, for more topics that we can discuss for the future, uh, write what you're interested in and we'll do our best to add those into our lineup. Today's topic is poop, coprolites, fantastic things. The, the word coprolite comes from two different base words, uh, copros meaning feces and light meaning stone, which means that coprolite literally means poop rock. Kind of funny. Yeah, we're really original at naming things. That's, that's how it goes in paleontology. <laughs> So what we're gonna be talking about are fossilized feces. They have all kinds of different names. And we have known about these for a long time, since about 1824-ish. Uh, over in Europe, there was a paleontologist. Uh, we consider her a paleontologist today, although they did not consider her a paleontologist then because they didn't allow girls to be paleontologists. Uh, her name was Mary Anning. And she was very, very, was very famous now. And she was actually pretty famous back then too. Um, but we had uh, Mary Anning, who worked over in England, finding all kinds of sea monsters and, and the mosasaurs, well not mosasaurs, but the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs um, that were local discoveries. And then she also found these odd little rocks, not just the ammonites and the sea creatures, but these odd little rocks. And she decided that um, she would break them open. And people would find these rocks and they would call them bezoar stones, 
which are hardened objects in your intestinal cavities and things that you just can't, can't digest and can't pass through. So people were already thinking they look kind of gross, they look kind of like poop, but they just kind of named them and it's like, ah, oh, just a funny looking rock, we'll call them a bezoar stone. Well, it turns out that they may have actually been poop. So she broke them open and sure enough on the inside of these rocks were bits of bone, there were shells, there were scales, there were all kinds of odds and ends from other things that were being eaten. So she rose the flag and went, hey, paleontologists and geologists out there, come take a look at these. I think this is something that you should really be studying. And she was kind of poo-pooed a little bit, no pun intended there, haha. -ha. <laughs> that was terrible. Oh, sorry. Ah, ah yes, yeah, yeah, sorry. Paleontology humor hits rock bottom. Oh. Anyway, so she was she was just kind of poo-pooed there. And she finally got uh, in touch with William Buckland, a renowned geologist. And she showed them to him and he looked at them and went, you know, I think you're right. And so he'd started writing papers in about 1829 on these coprolites. So then they were named coprolites. So that's when they started uh, entering our literature, entering our text. Okay. We have some fun little show and tell objects here. I don't have a book to read today, although there is, uh, there are a number of books out there, like Everybody Poops, there's a book. Uh, Animal Droppings, there's another book. We have lots of different books available out there. Uh, we just don't have them for, for reading. I don't have copyright, copyright licenses to actually get them reading, uh, read on air without getting in trouble. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab some of our odds and ends that we've discovered across North Dakota and a couple of other places. I'm going to start off with one that's not from North Dakota. This one right here. I'll get it nice and close to the camera so it focuses. There we go. Come on camera, focus. Focus camera. Anyways, so here we have a really cool piece. This is one that my dad gave me way back one when when I was but a wee lass. And I believe this one comes from a site over in Washington. And usually with coprolites, they are very rich in calcium phosphate due to the dissolved minerals that are within them. Uh, this one, however, does not have that high calcium phosphate content. It is something that we call a stein kern. So there's a fun word. So this is something that was dropped, deposited, and then it was buried, dried out. And the actual material, the organic material, the, the used food and the old bacteria that ends up getting excreted out, uh, dissolved away. And it was replaced with mud. So that is basically all this thing is, is this is just a cast of poo. So all it is is, is a chunk of rock. That's, that's basically all it is, but it looks like poo. So not, not all of it is actually uh, leftovers. So this is just a cast of a trace. Coprolites are considered trace fossils because they are the leftovers of creatures. They're not necessarily the creature itself. So you had um, footprints are a good trace fossil, feeding marks, leaf, uh, like insect chew marks would be a trace fossil, coprolites are a trace fossil, all these leftover things that aren't actually the animal itself, but are made by the animal. I've got another fun one. This has got some great character to it. Let me do there. It's even got a little curly cue at the end. Very neat. So they can come in all shapes and sizes, just like the droppings that are found today. And the curious thing about coprolites, though, are we have no idea who left them. Who done it? We don't know. Because I don't know about you, but I flushed mine down the toilet. I don't want to see head nods. Does everybody else flush theirs down the toilet? Yeah. Okay. Good. Thumbs up. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, no Ziploc baggies and carrying them out around for mementos because that's just gross. Um, and animals do the same thing. If you're a cat, you're going to bury it in cat litter. If you're a dog, maybe you kick some, some grass over the top of it. If you're a horse, you just keep walking. Um, so animals just get rid of their poop. They don't want anything to do with it either, except for dung beetles. They like poop. Oh, yeah. I, I should make, yes. Okay. I'm going to make Clint go walking behind me in order to pick up another example, which is kind of fun. 
I, I remembered it last night, but I forgot it today. So just a second. Meanwhile, we'll talk about another drop in here. Like I said, we don't know who done it, but we can have some ideas based on where these fossils were found, what available animals were around to do the business. Um, we can have at least some guesses, and especially if uh, what, what's inside the poop. What we can do is we can slab it up, we can look at it under a microscope, we can check to see are there bits of plants and seeds and other hard parts from plant eaters? Are there bits of bone or broken off teeth or shards of scale from a meat eater? So we can at least divide it up and tell, did this thing come from a plant eater? Did this thing come from a meat eater? So we can start fine tuning it a little bit. Uh, due to the nature of bones being high in calcium, the predator poop, our carnivores tends to, at least for North Dakota, we, we tend to find more carnivore poop than anything else. Um, most of the other stuff that we come across, you're not really sure, is it, a, is it an herbivore, is it not? Um, but you do have the occasional piece where you have a good idea of what it came from. So we have this Paleocene site over in Medora, and that site is renowned for holding all kinds of fossilized species, all different shapes, all different sizes. And again, most of that, we have no clue who it came from, except when you come across something like this. Now, we may not know exactly what this came from, but I'm pretty sure that this, based on my hand size here, did not come from a mouse, right? Totally not from a mouse and probably not from a little tiny turtle, and probably not from a little bird. So we can start crossing off some of those, those animals based on who we know could not have done this. Uh, this is like, this is baked potato size. You just add some sour cream on there, stick it in the oven, good to go. Or don't. <laughs> but this thing is filled with bone and uh, very high in the, in the calcium phosphate. Um, this particular one, you know, it's gonna be kind of hard to see on the camera, but there are little fish scales and things um, embedded in the surface of this coprolite, which means that it's coming from a carnivore. And the largest carnivores that we have over at this Medora site are crocodiles. So it's probably a good bet that this thing is crocodile poop. Now, do we know for sure, 100%? No but I'm like 99.9% .9 sure that this is from a crocodile and a big crocodile too. Pretty cool. Some of the other droppings we get at Medora are, are a little bit smaller, like this one here. So not, not quite as monstrous as that first one, but you get some cool character to it. You know, cool little, little dropping down at the end. So it's kind of where it pinched off right at the end. So it's got some good character, good shape. A healthy animal, right? Here we have just a, a little nugget. This, the, the nugget itself isn't much to look at. Uh, we've got a little pinched off section right here, but if I turn it around, see if I can get the camera to focus. Come on camera, you can do it. I know, right there, come on. Focus camera, focus. You can do it. Oh, it almost did. Uh, I know. No, don't look at the shelf. Look at the poop. See, even the camera doesn't want to look at poop. <laughs> anyway, this little black smear in here is a hunk of fish skull bone. Huh. Definitely from a carnivore. Definitely from something bigger than the fish. We get smaller little nuggets. Burp, little nuggets. What do they come from? Maybe a turtle, maybe a small crocodile. Kind of hard to say. Little nuggets running through there. This one's got, let's see if I can get it to focus. You can see the little brown marks on here too. These are fish bones. Come on. Put it in your mouth. Ah. Uh, right there you go. Oh, there we go. So there are little fish bones sitting in the, in the poo. And like I said, they come in all different sizes. When we're doing our micro picking, we'll wash our dirt that we collect from the Medora site. And it is filled with tiny, tiny, you know, light here is killing it. Lots of poop. 
little tiny vials filled with tiny poop. Probably fish poop, could have been salamander, something small. Probably not bird, just based on how they go. Nope. All right. We also have another site that can host uh, also car more carnivore poop. And this site is over by Dickinson. So Medora is also all kind of by Dickinson. It's west of, of Dickinson. Uh, and if you go south over in what we call the little badlands of North Dakota, we're changing time periods. So we're going from the Paleocene, which is about 60 million years ago or so, uh, to about 35 million years ago. And we deal, we find other kinds of carnivore poop, such as this thing. Doesn't look really you know, impressive at first, but there is actually a good, come on, focus. You can hide behind the poop, maybe it's the only thing to look at. Come on. Right in the center. Oh, it's trying. That's trying. It's trying. Oh, there we go. Okay, I have to freeze here. So here we have a chunk of bone that was found on the inside of that dropping. So another, another medium-sized carnivore, something that would be kind of coyote-sized uh, based on, on that dropping. Coyote are just a little bit bigger than a coyote. Much smaller one. Again, very high in that calcium phosphate content. Uh, so we have these other little creatures, like I mentioned, um, some things run away from, from their droppings, other things uh, run towards droppings, and one of those creatures would be a dung beetle. And also with this same, uh, same oligocene, eocene, miocene, so we get kind of a whole branching of everything. Uh, over, over at this little badland site, we get these layers in the rock, and they're all over the place, of these little balls. And yeah, you, know, you kind of ignore them at first and, and just kind of kind of get rid of them until you start realizing that no, these are these are poop balls, and these are probably made by little dung beetles. And you can see there's a little divot here at the top, a little little uh, extra little mark right there, and that is a pupil cell. So these dung beetles would gather together the poop from other animals, roll it up into little balls, bring it back to the nest, shove it underground because we're finding these things wedged in soil, uh, or, or paleo soil, what used to be the top layer. And these things are, are deposited in there along with an egg. So this is a food supply for a baby beetle. Baby beetle snack. Mmm. Ah. So really bothered that food has gone to that. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to mix it up. Yes, we have, we have dodo instead of trico today. We'll have to, have to swap it up a little bit. I'm trying to keep you guys occupied, right? <laughs> Maybe we'll make that the, like every day, what's Ooh, different on What's the different shelf? on the shelf? Yeah, there you go. The one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> yes, and Godzilla. Godzilla. Hello, Godzilla. So some general poop information, which is kind of interesting, is, is first of all, how did it become a fossil? How in the world could something that's soft and squishy and gross turn into something that's rock? And part of that is uh, a numbers game. That's really where math can come into paleontology as a, as a good example for STEM. So if you're working with uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, and you want to deal with the math portion, we're going to deal with uh, percentages and, and uh, amounts of things. So the things that tend to fossilize easier are hard parts in our bodies, bones, teeth, all, all of these, these hard spots tend to fossilize a lot easier than something soft and squishy like skin or muscle or hair. Uh, any, any of those tend to just rot away relatively quickly, including your guts, including poop. So, so how in the world did these things become a fossil in the first place? And again, part of that is numbers. If you have one skeleton, you live to be 100 years old, you will in your life produce one single skeleton. Now that skeleton is made up of lots of bones, lots of indiv individual pieces, but you have one skeleton, one chance for that really to become a fossil. But if you live to be 100 years old and you still go all the way over there, you know, zero to 100, you go to the bathroom a lot and will probably end up 
producing around a quarter million poops, something like that. That's a huge number. So if you have one of something, so our, our skeleton, and you have a quarter million of something else for poop, numbers tell us that quarter million is gonna have a better chance of becoming a fossil than our one skeleton. And that also goes along with the whole circle of life and the food chain. It's all just a giant numbers game. So up at the top of the food chain, you have your carnivores, which are eating other creatures. And there's very few as far as like mass numbers. You're not talking about thousands of lions roaming the, the savanna. No, you're talking about a small pride of lions. And what do the, what do the lions hunt? Well, the, they're, they're hunting thousands and tens of, tens of thousands of gazelles and zebras and wildebeests and, and other little beasties that are running around. So you need a very large supply of plant eaters for your small supply of carnivores to eat. And then of course your plant eaters, we shrink those down, you need a whole bunch of plants for those plant eaters to consume as well. So it's a big pyramid. Way up at the top you have your carnivores, in the middle you have your plant eaters, and down at the bottom you have your plants. And so it's a numbers game. And that's what we're kind of finding with fossils too, is that you get a lot of plants, a lot of plant eaters, and then not so many of your carnivores, not so many of your meat eaters. But again, you have a bias based on where things are fossilizing and becoming a fossil. And so poop is following that same trend. You have a lot of them, we're gonna find at least some of them. So it's kind of neat. So that's how, how in the world something becomes fossil, fossilized. You know, you're going to have something dry out in the sun or it gets buried relatively quickly. Um, so it's going to be preserved. Now, not all the poop that we find is pretty. Some of it is really gross. Some of it has obviously been walked on or kicked around. Uh, we'll find fish vertebra that are caked in poop that have obviously been, been defecated and then washed, tumbled, a uh, little bit of tumbled action running through there. So these, these fish have been eaten, pooped, and then re-cleaned. Kind of interesting. So not all the poop that we find is pretty, um, but it is interesting. It's definitely interesting. And I bet you know that there's all kinds of different words for poop, right? Lots of different words for poop. And we're gonna go through some, some cool ones based on animals, what kinds of animals. So for instance, if you are a rancher, if you have cattle out in your field, you're probably going to call those, those droppings, droppings, or dung, or pats. Meadow muffins are a good one. They tend to sprout a whole bunch of mushrooms on those, so it looks like a little mini, mini mushrooms factory. It's kind of gross. Um, if you have horses, the joke is that they're called road apples. Because before there were cars, these horses would wander you know, down the road and they would drop them. And they're kind of round and self-contained and about the size of an apple. So you would have a road apple. Um, one thing that we've dealt with up in the, the house that we're refurbishing, uh, insect droppings, specifically those uh, that are, that are plant-eating insects like carpenter ants or caterpillars, uh, leaf beetles, things like that, you're going to be calling that frass. That's F-R-A-S-S. -S. And it's a good way to find carpenter ants is as you're wandering around and you're doing some home remodeling and you come across your, your stud wall and you've already removed all the sheetrock from your wall and you see this little pile of shavings. They, they look like sprinkles, except for brown. So they're not chocolate, trust me, they're not chocolate. So you find this little pile and it's called frass. And so then you know, aha, you have a problem, you should probably contact some kind of a pest control or do the best you can solo. Uh, let's see here. Of course, you already know feces, so it's fossil feces. That's just in general, any kind of an excrement type thing. Deer, when you have a pile of the deer, they, they look like little uh, cocoa puffs. <laughs> I know, all kinds of food, just great, great time for breakfast, right? So it looks like a big pile of cocoa puffs. Same thing with, with uh, rabbit. It's called fumets. Carnivores, like our crocodile or the coyote or any of those, those um, coyote-sized creatures, you'd be calling it scat. So, you know, shoo, shoo, scat. Back, you know, same spelling, S-C-A-T. I'm, I'm getting head shakes off to the side. Um, sprint 
is, an, is one that's reserved for otters and tends to be very smelly because otters are in the mustelid family and they produce kind of a, an oily secretion and they use it for marking territory. So that can be used um, for that purpose. Bird droppings, you can go a couple different directions, one of which is just literally droppings. And birds are kind of weird because their, their urine, their pee mixes in with their poop. So you get crystals or, or white goop. If you ever see bird droppings, you're out and wandering around, and you see a splat of something on the sidewalk. Um, and it's white and brown. It's because they're mixing both their, their urea and or their uric acid and their, their poop together. So it's just literally called droppings. Um, and then seabirds, which I don't know, it tends to be just like really wet and goopy, uh, along with bats, which tend to cover the floor of, of wherever it is that they're roosting, is called guano. All kinds of fun ones. And I just learned a new one today. Clint told me a new one today uh, that I didn't know. It's called peloid. Ah, said I right. Peloid, which in the fossil world is a layer of fish poop that's turned into rock, essentially. So it's fish poop rock is a peloid. See, everybody's learning new stuff today. Okay, wow. Sorry, I chatted for poop for a long time there. <laughs> so Clint is gonna start reading off some questions to me and then as we go, uh, we'll, we'll start answering questions from the, from the chat uh, window as well. So go for it. <clears throat> trying to get, we have some general ones and I'm trying to get the mm -hmm. poop specific ones first. Um, what's the oldest coprolite? What is the oldest coprolite? Um, I don't know, but I, yeah. <laughs> it's it kind of hard to tell because you can get, again, those, those stein kerns where, where all of the actual poop material is gone and all you're left with is the cast. Um, I don't know what the oldest poop is. The oldest poop that I have is phytosaur poop that I collected uh, over in North Carolina. So that was kind of fun. So that's, that's pretty old stuff. That's, that's uh, like Triassic poop. Huh. Could you find fossil poop still in the body of an animal? Can you find fossil poop still in the body of an animal? Yes, you can. And that is one of the best ways to figure out who in the world it is. So you can find dead animals, uh, the, the, car the carcasses, the fossils, and then in their bellies, they'll have some of, some of their remains and they'll be in place where their intestines would have been. And so you can find poop on the inside of, of uh, animal cavities. And you can find another thing called a gastrolith on certain creatures, which are stomach stones, which are big stones that help grind together plant material, kind of like how birds have a gizzard and they'll eat rocks to help grind up seeds. Um, some of these dinosaurs will, will swallow stones in order to help grind up plants as well. And so you will find stomach stones, these gastroliths, in one section of the body, and then you'll find poop in the other section of the body. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Smallest coprolites. Smallest coprolites. Well, what is small? Uh, you can get uh, pretty, pretty tiny. Let's see. Let's dig in here. Come on, get up here. I'm just gonna pour some out of my hand here. Uh, the, some of the smallest ones, the, these ones are really, really cool. You're really not gonna be able to see this, but it looks like pencil lead. It's tubular. These are, uh, sorry, cameras just not wanting to focus in on this little teeny tiny thing. But, come on. But it's, it's like a little, little chunk of pencil lead is basically what this poop is. And the side view, of these poops from Medora, uh, they're pink in color. So some can get pretty small. You would have to pick them out from, from a, uh, a microscope though. Have you ever dissected a piece of poop? Have I ever dissected a piece of poop? Um, yes, I have dissected fossil poop. I have dissected modern poop. Um, Good story, when I first met my husband, 
uh, he was showing me around the outside of the house and, and we were cruising around and, and down at the corner of the, of the house were these little strange pellets. And I'm like, fantastic, it's an owl pellet. And so I, I reach down and I, I pick up this thing and I'm holding this, this chunk of owl pellet in my hand. Like, this is so cool. And he, he kind of looks at me funny and he holds out his hand. And so I hand it over to him and he's like, what? What am I looking at? It's like, it's, it's an owl pellet. It's puke, it's vomit. So it's not quite poop, but it goes out back the other end. And he kind of looked at me like, you had me touch puke? Like, well, you held out your hand. I thought you knew what it was. I'm like, yeah. So he still married me. Ugh. Must not have been too terrible. What is the most interesting copper light you found in North Dakota? What is the most interesting copper light we found in North Dakota? Um, I like the Medora ones just because of, of their classic little Dairy Queen queue at the end, and uh, I don't know. There's that one they have at the Pioneer Trails. Museum. Ah, yeah, okay, there, there is there's one down in Bowman, the Pioneer Trails Regional Museum. Uh, I don't believe it's on display, but it is back in their collections room, and it's a really cool specimen. They think it's actually T-Rex poop, and the reason for this is that the, first of all, it's huge. I mean, way bigger than any crocodile poop that I was holding, like, poop, big poop. So it's big uh, and it is filled with bone shards and not only bone shards, but also shed T-Rex teeth. Now to have a T-Rex tooth end up in poop, um, <clears throat> you're either gonna have to go around and eat a T-Rex tooth or you will be the T-Rex and you're gonna consume something, break off a tooth, you, you hit a chunk of bone that's extra hard and you swallow it and then it comes out the other end. So that's probably what happened here. We have this, this just bone shards. And I was doing some reading last night in order to catch up on different kinds of carnivore poop. I know, researching for everybody. And there, were, there was a really cool article written by uh, Dr. Karen Chin, and she is world renowned. She's like the queen of poop. She's over in Colorado. And she knows more about coprolites than I think anybody ever would. Uh, she's amazing. And she wrote this piece on carnivore poop and how to distinguish it and, and why they think this one poop that they had found was, was also T-Rex poop. And how uh, the inside of the poop was just riddled with bone shards. And more shards than would um, come from just like gizzard stones, those, those stones to help grind up seeds, more than would account for that. So they're thinking that T-Rex was indiscriminate. It didn't care. It would just grab a hunk of meat and bone and crunch it, and it would just chomp it into a bite-sized piece, swallow it, digest it, and out it would go. So our T-Rex had bone crushing teeth. And there's all kinds of really cool videos up on YouTube, I know, where they're actually showing the bite force of T-Rex and, and how it can destroy bone. And that's definitely what we're seeing in the T-Rex poop. So interesting. Is dinosaur poop common? Is dinosaur poop common? Probably. Um, sometimes we don't know what we're looking at because it's going to look like another rock. Um, usually you tend to know by the shape or the color, uh, especially if that poop is broken. Um, like I said for the Medora poop here. So here it's kind of brown on the outside, but wherever it's broken, you get this light pink color, which is very uh, indicative. It shows uh, the poop at this particular site and all of the poop at this site has this brown outer coating and this pink inside. It's just how it preserved. Do other animals do a similar thing as dung beetles or is it just dung beetles? Do other animals do a similar thing as dung beetles or is it just dung beetles? Um, Kind of. So there is a special term we use for things that eat poop. It's called coprophagy or coprophagus. So if you are an animal that eats poop, you are coprophagous. And there are actually a lot of poop eaters out there, not just dung beetles. Um, if you have a dog, you've probably discovered that your dog loves to get into the cat treat box, right? 
yeah, we've had to wall ours off. We have a fence in front of our litter box because the dog thinks that cat treats are amazing. Um, dogs are actually kind of copophagous and they'll roll in it and they'll eat it. My dad's dog loves eating goose poop. Um, I don't know why, it's just weird. They're, they're trying to introduce extra bacteria into their gut stream or something, it's just nasty. Ugh. It's a dog thing. Um, rabbits eat their poop. Rabbits produce two different, and legomorphs, so rabbits and hares, your bunnies, your cottontails, produce two different kinds of poop. Ah, uh, no, I forgot the word for the one. It starts with a C. Ah, I'll have to look it up. I'll, I'll stick it up on YouTube. I'll have a little window that pops up down here or something saying, ah, this is the word. Um, but there is a uh, one kind of poop that they eat or that's, that's kind of sticky. And their tummies aren't great at digesting. They don't ruminate like a cow chews cud. So a cow will eat a mouthful of stuff, swallow it, barf it back up again, chew some more, swallow it, barf it back up again, over and over again, in order to really, really grind it down and break down cellulose, because our tummies are not good at breaking down that plant matter. That's why you see corn a couple days after you eat corn. <laughs> so rabbits are also not very good at digesting plant matter, even though they eat plants. So to accommodate this, what they do is they eat their food, they eat their grass, they poop it out, they go back and they eat the special sticky poop to redigest and pull out all the rest of the nutrients. And then when they're finally done with it, then you get your little cocoa puff poop. It's a little, little pile of, of droppings that are really, really super dry and, and not sticky at all. So there are other animals that are utilizing poop to help with gut flora, bacteria, to help you digest things, to keep you healthy, actually. Um, but I don't know specifically anything more about dung beetles. What are your earrings? What are my earrings? I decided that I would wear my diamond earrings today. If you play Minecraft, you'll get it. How deep do you have to dig to get copper lights? How deep do you have to dig to get copper lights? Um, they can be sitting right at the surface. It really depends on how the rock layers are uh, eroding. So you've got all these layers of rock and poop could be anywhere within that layer uh, or layers. So in the case of our dung beetle balls, um, for these things, they can be sitting right at the surface because they've weathered out. Or you can walk by a hillside and you'll notice all the little layers in the hillside and you'll have one little layer in here that looks polka dotted. And upon closer inspection, sure enough, they're just riddled with these dung beetle balls. Um, so it can be right at the surface. You can dig. Doesn't, doesn't really make much of a difference. It's just all erosion and where they are in, in the rock layers. How do you tell rocks from poop and vice versa? How do you tell rocks from poop and vice versa? Um, finding bone shards is a really good way. So if you're looking at a uh, piece of rock that looks kind of like poop and you're not really sure uh, and it gets broken open and there's stuff on the inside, extra bones or shells or, or scales, that's a probably, probably a pretty good way to tell. Um, some of it is, is kind of tough. If you pick up a rock and you're like, I wonder if this is poop, and that rock is made out of granite or basalt or any of these igneous types of rocks, like it can look like poop, like they, they'll be poop sized, um, that's not going to be poop because you don't get igneous fossils unless you have something that's been covered by lava. It, it's kind of hard to tell. You, usually you have to, to find a few of them and some of them end up getting broken open and you do some chemical tests on them to see if they're high in calcium phosphate and rinse repeat. What's the most interesting poop you ever saw? The most interesting poop I've ever seen? Probably when my cat ate tinsel. It was very shiny. Oh boy. <laughs> Um, people want to know what our YouTube channel is called. Uh, what is our YouTube channel? Uh, that's a good question. I was trying to see if there was like some kind of a cool title or something and I can't find a cool title on it. Uh, we have the link up on our Facebook page. Uh, I have the link up also on Twitter. Um, I'll have to see if there's, there's some way that we can like name the channel. Uh, again, we're very new to this as well. We only have a few few things up there. So if any of you have posted a whole bunch of YouTube videos, we are up for instruction. 
you can look for NDGS Paleo. Yeah, we can. I did we can that this morning. Yeah, you can. NDGS Paleo and. Yeah, uh, you can you can find us by searching for NDGS Paleo because I'm making sure to tag everything, and that's what our channel is is just NDGS Paleo. Um, so if you do a little search in the in the search engine, it'll, it'll come up as like who the author is, and that's us. So we're we're keeping everything the same: Twitter, Instagram, all all of your your social media stuff, including YouTube uh, and any presence that we have on the web. We're just trying to keep NDGS Paleo. Follow us. Follow us. Subscribe. <laughs> what, what what is it on the? It's like subscribe on the link below. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you've got to add a link. I know. So what's the best place to dig for dinosaurs in North Dakota? What's the best place to dig for dinosaurs in North Dakota? Uh, again, that's due to the rocks that are at the surface. And we have two zones across North Dakota that are good for dinosaurs. One of which is south of Bismarck Mandan. And one of which is uh, down by the Mud Buttes area, uh, which is in the southwestern corner of the state by Marmoth, Bowman, Rame. That's all dinosaur country. That's, that's where the Hell Creek Formation, that layer of rocks of the late Cretaceous, is starting to weather out at the surface. And so that's a good, that's a good place to look. You can, there, there are dinosaurs all across the state, but you're going to have to go down hundreds to thousands of feet. You want to repeat your favorite dinosaur again today? <laughs> What's my favorite dinosaur? Triceratops. What's the favorite, your favorite part of your job? What is my favorite part of my job? Um, I honestly like the variety. Uh, I get to talk to you guys. Uh, I got, get to chat online. I get to do outreach. Uh, I love doing fossil preparation. That is my, my technical job is I am the lab manager, a paleontologist. So I'm out in the summer digging fossils and I'm back in the lab in the wintertime putting those fossils back together again. I get to produce books for education. I'm working on another one right now. Ooh. Sneak preview. We'll get this thing printed and done too. Ah! All my various watercolor stuff. I'll zip through there. Some some fun material. So this is a, a book that we're writing about Dakota the dinosaur mummy, who is a Cretaceous cow. Fun stuff. So I get to do some watercolors. I get to do some drawing. I get to do technical illustration. Oh my goodness, so many dots. So very many dots. I like this one. That one took me forever. So fun stuff like that. Uh, I just like the variety. We're running out of time, yep. so we're going to do like one more question and then we're going to pull the plug. Again, thank you for, for joining us today. Um, spread the word. You can come back. We'll be here tomorrow. Tomorrow's topic will be ammonites. So we'll be dealing with some more sea creatures uh, with some really cool, cool shells and cool adaptations. So tomorrow is ammonites. We'll be again, uh, same place, same time, 10 o'clock central. And then since we now know that at least for part of the state, school will be out next week, um, Probably at the end of tomorrow, we'll release a whole schedule for next week, so you'll know what topics will be. Yep. So, so because Bismarck schools, Mandan schools are are out, uh, and I'm assuming many of the other cities are also going to be out. Uh, we will continue this streaming next week as well, and we'll get a schedule of events up and going. Uh, this thing. The the compiling of the video takes a little bit of time, so it's not going to be instantaneously up on YouTube. Uh, I will get it up as fast as possible, but I have to finish work here, transfer the video, work from home, compile, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. So we'll, we'll get it up on YouTube as fast as possible though. Uh, last question that hmm? I don't really know the answer to. Uh -oh. Is there fossilized bird poop that's been found? Oh, is there fossilized bird poop that's been found? We have no idea. Because the urea I would think is just gonna disappear be a lot harder to get fossilized. It's gonna, it would be really super duper rare. Um, bird fossils themselves are really super duper rare. Um, bird droppings I think would be even worse. So not that I know of, I don't know. Okay, well thank you everybody for, for joining us today. Uh, tune in tomorrow and we will continue our random chatting. <laughs>